All right, with that, let's begin. I think there's a question over here, please. When you get the microphone, please, uh, please ask. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks everyone. Uh, my question is regarding MOG. Uh, traditionally, the literature says if there are a second attack, you tend to go on lifelong therapy, such as rituximab and other things. Uh, in a recent MOG project webinar, Dr. Professor Russell Dale spoke about what he called stuttering events, where people tend to have maybe two or three attacks within two months, and then nothing after that, even all on long-term immunosuppression. I wanted to get your thoughts on whether or not there's a point, if you've, in that category where you've only had a couple attacks after your initial attack, nothing after that, whether or not there's a point where you would consider discontinuing use of rituximab or other autoimmunosuppressants. So maybe we could have, uh, Michael, do you want to start off with that one, please? Okay. Um, I was going to let um, Simon start since it's an Australian who gave that advice, but... Um, um, my, my thinking about MOG is that there must be some vulnerability to attacks and that maybe it never goes away completely but certainly there's MOG activity that seems to occur in clusters and it mostly happens, I've seen it, when you start to reduce steroid doses and then the relapse occurs and then you try again and the relapse occurs and it's a miserable few months in your life but then once you finally get off of the steroids, then things might die down a little bit, especially with treatment. And then the big question is, well, how long does that have to continue? How long do you have to keep the immune system suppressed? And I think people have different feelings on this. I'd love to hear from this panel, but my feeling is that after a few years, I've seen the MOG antibody turn negative, and it's encouraging to me, and I, I feel like maybe that would be the point when we can stop treatment. But I had great conversations with folks yesterday who say that in their experience, the MOG antibody never goes away. It's always a little bit detectable. And so what does that mean? Does that mean that there's always going to be a vulnerability? Um, so I don't know. I would love to hear, especially from, from PEDS in Australia. Thank you, Michael. Um, look, I think um, early symptoms occurring after a relapse is always a difficult one um, to know what that means. There are particularly with transverse myelitis, I think you can see a development and a progression of symptoms, sometimes with new symptoms emerging, which actually might be part of the repair process happening. Mm. As Michael's mentioned, I think as you wean off steroids, so maybe if you do it too quickly or if there isn't a tapering dose of steroids, you can see re-emergence of what was probably the original attack coming back, uh, but it's because you've dropped the steroids too quickly. Whether that's a new relapse or not is always difficult to know. Um, but certainly, I would always worry about, you know, a new and completely different set of symptoms, you know, that I think if it's affecting a different part of the nervous system, I would worry about that being a second relapse and therefore would be more inclined to treat with long-term therapy. Sylvia, do you want to add any additional perspectives from pediatrics? It's all, it's okay. okay. Now it's okay? Yeah. yeah. Well, in children, um, we have different clinical presentations and many of them, the more frequent is ADM. And frequently an ADM presentation is a monophasic disorder with MOG antibody positive patients. And usually we don't start immunosuppression in those cases. But in those relapsing forms, maybe after an ADN with an optic neuritis or after many optic neuritis as the only clinical way of demonstrating the MOGAD disease. Uh, we usually start immunosuppression with rituximab, like you say in adults. And it's difficult to say if we can start tapering the immunosuppression after a couple of years, two, five years. I have tried following the European experience. There is a pediatric European group suggesting that after two years we can start taking out, taking off the immunosuppression. And I tried in a couple of patients and it didn't work. So I'm afraid that probably two years is not enough to assume that the patient is seronegative and we can take off the rituximab. So I'm taking at least five years to try that. But I don't have a scientific evidence to answer you, okay? The only thing I can say that I don't want to see my patients with a, 
additional severe relapse. So I prefer to continue under immunosuppression and to see how the things are going on. On the clinical point of view, on the MRI uh, evaluation, before deciding if I'm going to taper in the treatment. So I cannot give you a definite answer. Sylvia, thank you so much. Um, great question. Let's go to the next question. I think there was a question over here. Please. Thanks, Evan. Hi, I have um, the Edamone. I've been on Solaris for almost three years. Um, is there ever a time when I can come off of that? Or is there a different drug that I can use where I don't have to go into the hospital like every two weeks to have the infusion done? And will the lesions that I have on my spine ever disappear? Or do they get bigger? Orhan, would you like to start on that? Thank you for this issue. I think uh, the problem, um, the challenge that you just described is really a daily, uh, it's a daily challenge, you know. Uh, we know that Solaris works very fast and stabilizes, but nevertheless then of course keeping track and uh, uh, of course sticking to the B-weekly treatment is really a problem. Um, we, um, we think that, that the new developments uh, could help us. For example, there's a substance which is quite similar to Soliris, which is, uh, which is expected to be approved now also in NMOST, uh, which then requires every eight week uh, therapy only. And this would, of course, deliver to you and to others who are being treated with, uh, with the complement inhibitor, of course, many advantages. Uh, this would help a lot. The other thing, of course, regarding progression um, or activity, as far as we see, we, we are able to achieve really stability by this kind of medication. Uh, of course, repair processes depend, uh, uh, depend on, on, on other, other issues, and sometimes you also see kind of a recovery, but recovery is a tough issue. And we try hard, you know, to do both, you know, not only giving drugs, but also trying to do the rehab and to, uh, to, um, to also, of course, to increase internal aspects, resilience, uh, and um, to strengthen uh, body's own, um, uh, the body's own, uh, let's say, uh, power in order to induce recovery. Michael, do you want to add any more to... Um lesion evolution and do they ever go away or yeah in my experience they don't tend to go away mog lesions can heal nicely sometimes they go away that sometimes is, is even a clue to me when i don't know what a patient has if a lesion goes away then i think oh then that's probably not aquaporin 4 because those lesions are so destructive and permanent it's an area of unmet need for sure it's something that we really need to fix because even with all these great drugs across the hall, I could talk till I'm blue in the face about them and my patients will say, great, so when am I getting out of my wheelchair? And it, it doesn't work that way, and so we really need to figure out how to regenerate that damaged tissue. Michael, thank you. Um, question over here, please. Uh, Corey, to your right first, okay. Hello, uh, Julia Leffler from the MOG Project, and um, we get a lot of questions and um, emails from people, you know, who fail on one treatment after another for MOG. Um, what, what would you tell them about, you know, the difficulties sometimes in getting stable with MOG therapies, and you uh, suggest combining, asking doctors to combine treatments, and is, uh, is there hope for them for new treatments coming up as some of the NMOSD therapies um, are tested. Simon, do you want to start on the adult side and then Sylvia will talk about combination therapy in kids. Okay, S Simon, please. Sure, no, great question. And 
my experience has been that a lot of people with MOGED respond very well to rituximab, but there's a small group who, you know, continue to have relapses despite having no B cells. Um, and, you know, you need to combine treatments so you add an additional um, immunosuppressive agent. Um, so there are some people, and even then, you know, use of steroids, immunosuppression, and B cell depletion, they can still have disease activity. Um, so there's certainly a group who are very resistant to treatment, and we need some better treatments, which are, as you've already heard this morning, now being tested in MOGED. Um, uh, and, uh, and that'll be a great step forward if we can find other things that work uh, in addition to what we currently have. Sylvia? Yes, in children, uh, all the pediatric neurologists start as well with rituximab in MOGAD patients showing relapses. Um, many of them respond quite well. It's not the same response that we expect because in AQP4 positive and MOST patients, rituximab is working very well, and it's not the same in MOGAD. Uh, in those patients that show, are showing relapses, even with the adequate dose of rituximab infusions, we associate in some of them oral therapy like mycophenolate mofadil, in others, because the body weight allows us to use IVIG monthly, in addition with a rituximab or instead of rituximab, we try to see what is working for each patient because there is no control studies informing us which is the perfect combination up until the moment that we have the perfect therapy for MOGAD. We still we don't have, but there are on the way some studies trying to demonstrate if some of the approved therapies for AQP4 positive and MOSD may be used for MOGAD with the same kind of uh, high positive response. Until see that, we still need to continue combining therapies, IVIG, oral therapies, rituximab. We try not to give uh, prednisone oral corticosteroids because of the side effects. And in children, they are very severe. So prolonged use of corticosteroids are very bad for children, and we try to avoid that. Sylvia, thank you very much. We have a question over on the right side. Corey, please. Good morning. Uh, my question is, is there any commonality between patients that have narcolepsy and NMO since they both come from the central nervous system, and is there any research for treatment for that? Michael, do you want to start? I saw an interesting case, one of the first times I've ever seen that narcolepsy from NMO, and it was in a woman who I was treating, and she came into the emergency room and could not stay awake for more than two minutes. And everybody thought it was disrespectful that she couldn't even stay awake for a doctor's um, examination, but she literally couldn't. And when we scanned her brain, we saw new lesions in the part of the brain that controls those sleep cycles. And so that was the first time I'd experienced it, maybe 15 years ago, that I'd seen that. And since then, it's been published a few cases here and there where NMO will specifically attack those parts of the brain, and it causes a syndrome that is indistinguishable from narcolepsy. And it tends to heal well, and after a period of time, the narcolepsy tends to fade, but sometimes you'll still need um, stimulants to keep a patient awake after an attack like that from NMO. I've not seen that with MOG. Thank you, Michael. We have a question uh, over on this side of the room, please. Hi, good morning. Um, I was diagnosed five years ago, and I take Imuran daily. I'm the kind of person who doesn't question my doctor. I love my doctors. I stay with the same telephone, doctor, every house, for, forever. My doctor just moved to Texas, and I have a new doctor. And for me, the That's irony is that, well, first, my question is, is there any kind of certification process that uh, neurologists like yourself have to go through in the United States? Because I feel that my new doctor <laughs> thinks that, you know, Oh, you look fine. You're you're doing okay on Imuran. We can stop the Imuran. And I'm thinking, no, 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 no. I don't want to 
go back five years to a relapse. So that's my question, I guess. Is there a certification board or something in the United States that doctors must go through that I could check? Thank you. Don't scratch it. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, I think that one's for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> As the American on the stage here, I, I'm afraid no. There's no certification. I would say that there's a comfort level that most doctors either have or don't. And if you come with neuromyelitis optica and they say, oh, I know what that is, I know how to treat it, there's FDA approved drugs, then I, I, I sense that that's the, that's, that might be a good threshold. And if they say, I don't know what that is, I don't like that, you should go find a consultant and I'll work with them, then that, that might be better. But um, it, it's a, I don't think it's a good practice to suggest coming off of therapy when it's actually working. That's like holding up an umbrella in a rainstorm and saying, oh, I'm dry now, you know, I can take the umbrella down. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm glad that you recognize that that was not the right move. For, for those of you around the world, Orhan, maybe you were going to, to talk about this, but can you tell us your perspective of expertise in NMO, MOGA disease amongst colleagues in Germany, for example? I, just want to add that indeed in Germany and also in Europe, I'm not aware of a specific certification process for neuroimmunology. Perhaps we would need that in future because you know the, the whole discipline of neurology is now changing and we get more and more specialized in different diseases. So that for example, experts in stroke, you know, are so specialized so that uh, whatever they talk about, you know, is so special that I as a neuroimmunologist, you know, I'm, I have problems, you know, to follow them, <laughs> and therefore, um, um, therefore, it may be wise indeed to 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 have that such a kind of a certification. I totally agree, but we don't have that. But this is also, of course, the mission. I have to say of uh, of uh, of, um, uh, of our activities here, and I'm so grateful for to to the Gathe Jackson Foundation, you know, putting all the experts together together with you, all the caregivers, so that we can exchange, so that we have a kind of a global understanding and standard, what is, has to be done and uh, to understand the disease. And by that, of course, we are kind of ambassadors also for our given countries, and we try to disseminate our, uh, um, our, um, the, the new issues and the new knowledge, and not only to educate, you know, people affected, people with NMOSC or MOGAD, but also to educate our fellow doctors. This is really important, and this is really a mission. Orhan, thank you. Victoria. No, I just, uh, it should be on. Um, I just wanted to also add and build on that for the, for the woman who asked the question, too, that I think it's great. You definitely want to know about the certifications of, of the doctors and the, and the therapies. But I think it's also so important to, as you continue to educate yourself, to also rely on your own instincts as well um, and learn about some of these, like staying on Imuram might be the way to go, but it might also be a lot of the doctors may not know uh, about some of the new therapies. And I guess what I really want this day to continue, as you think you said so, so well, um, is that you have to, start educating yourself and, and use your instincts, just not as much, yes, worry about the certifications of the, of the people you're talking to, but I want you to become the one that, as you educate yourself, will make the best decisions for you. Thank you, Victoria. We have some patients that could not be here today, and so we asked them to send in a few questions. Lisa, could you please take one of those? Of course, thank you. Um, we have a question that came in and it says, what are the main differences between MOGAD, NMO, and is there a difference between NMOSD and NMO? Michael, do you want to start or Simon? Simon, please. Um, thank you. Um, so I think there is an issue about the nomenclature, so the naming of these conditions, and um, I think there's no doubt there's a difference between aquaporid before related disease and MOG related disease. Um, there is considerable overlap, as there is considerable overlap with multiple sclerosis as well. Um, but in terms of the spectrum of disease, um, MOGAD in particular has uh, some kind of additional 
components that you don't really see in NMO, and similarly, NMO has some presentations that you would very rarely see in MOGAD. So, and particularly, the difference in pediatric cases uh, is, is even more marked uh, between the two conditions. So I think uh, they are two very different conditions. Um, uh, the ADEM type presentations in pediatrics is a prominent feature of MOGAD. Um, the very frequent recurring optic neuritis um, in MOGAD in adults is uh, quite distinctive, I think. Um, uh, and the kind of differences are subtle, um, but when you've seen a number of cases, I think it becomes quite clear. And we've had discussions over the last 24 hours about how a lot of cases you can kind of pick even before you've done the test. Uh, but that's only with experience. Um, so in terms of what NMOSD is, um, I think there's a sort of move to put that as the overarching term for these conditions, but I'm not even sure that that captures uh, all of the cases, particularly for MOGAD. I think most of the cases in MOGAD that I see have previously, I would have thought of being as fairly kind of typical MS. Mm. Um, uh, and I wouldn't have been thinking as suspicious for NMO. Um, so you have to test a, a lot of your existing cases of MS to pick them up. I don't know what other people think. Simon, thank you. Michael or uh, Sylvia, any other comments? Thank you. Okay, um, my understanding is that NMO is defined by the clinical MRI involvement. So it's the definition of the clinical presentation, mainly involving optic nerve and spinal cord. And the spectrum became after knowing that AQP4 positive was more specific, and you may have other clinical presentation more subtle or more specific in some areas of the central nervous system. But usually continue involving optic nerve and spinal cord as the mainly uh, areas, and the area postrema as well. But MOGAD is defined by the serotest. So the patients becoming positive for MOG in serum should have the spectrum of diseases associated with this antibody. And in children particularly, this spectrum is very wide. You have an acute encephalopathy, that's the name of ADM. It looks like a meningoencephalitis, but with brain lesions that uh, feature the ADM picture. And you have optic neuritis just alone single event or recurrent events of optic neuritis, and you may have a spinal cord, longitudinal spinal cord involvement without optic nerve and without an ADM involvement, and you may also have an acute encephalitis, like a pure children's with a depression of the consciousness and seizures. Status epilepticus are difficult to be treated, and you have a the clear picture of cortical enhancement or cortical uh, involvement in FLIR, and you have more antibodies in the serum. So the spectrum is very wide. It's not defined by a topography. It's defined by the serotest. But you should have some of these clinical pictures that I have described. That's the name MOGAD. It's the spectrum of diseases associated with this antibody. Some small group of these children may show only spinal cord and optic nerve involvement with some of the MRI pictures of NMOSD. That's the reason that becoming a subgroup of MOGAD patients with this picture of NMOSD. But there are two different diseases. This is my understanding. Because we are still fighting, okay? It's not so clear. <laughs> Sylvia, thank you. In some ways, we think about these diseases as cousins, not twins, right? And as you said, for MOGAD, you must be anti-MOG positive. For NMOSD, you, you need not be anti-aquaporin-4 positive, but most, many people are, right? So. Adults. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, adults, thank you very much. Um, there's a question over here in the front. Um, Lisa, thank you. Just a reminder, there's another session of Ask the Docs after this. And 
even another one after that. So it's all good. Hi. Um, I don't know who to direct my question to, but um, I know the previous answer to this question was no. Um, but considering the research over you know the past five years or so, um, is there anything that indicates there would be a way to predict that somebody could have this disease prior to their first attack? Because um, in mentioning the um, the uh, what's the, the sleep thing you said? Narcolepsy. Narcolepsy thing. Sorry. Um, I know I I was diagnosed with. Um, idiopathic hypersomnia. I was just shy of being narcoleptic 15 years ago, and my first bug attack was in 2017. So um, there were definite other things, too, that indicated that I probably, you know, that may have been contributing to my, or a part of my MOG antibody disease prior to my first, my optic neuritis. Um, is there anything that indicates that you may be able to, in the future, there may be a way to, um, predict, because you said there's biomarkers that may indicate a relapse is coming. Is there a test that may predict that uh, people could perhaps have this if they're having these rare, weird neurologic symptoms that aren't necessarily optic neuritis or transverse myelitis? Orhan, let's begin with you focused on genetics of NMOSD and MOGAD disease and potentially narcolepsy, and then we'll go from there, okay? Well, regarding genetics, it's like that, that there is so far, unfortunately, no clear pattern. Um, we know that uh, uh, people with autoimmune diseases have, of course, certain kind of clusters, um, that they are more prone to autoimmune reactions in general. And this is also the case for uh, people with NMOSD, that they have more often, at the same time, other autoimmune or rheumatological diseases. But nevertheless, there is no single gene or testing which, which could now really explain animal or which could predict now the development of aquaporin 4 zero positive or NMOSC or of um, MOGAT. This is really an issue. And uh, narcolepsy itself, there we have defined clusters. For narcolepsy, there we have really defined uh, genetic cluster. But when we are speaking of narcolepsy, of course, one thing is, of course, the symptoms of being tired, what just uh, Michael explained, when, when the lesion is at, this, at, at, at a place where, which regulates sleep. Uh, this may look like genetic narcolepsy, but uh, it's, it's not genetic narcolepsy, but it's just by chance that the uh, disease, that the uh, NMOST hit the, the right place so that it looks like narcolepsy. But, in, in truth, it's now not a genetic disease, narcolepsy. That's something that has, one has to uh, distinguish. Regarding prodromal stadium, this is also an issue. You know, what, what happens before the very first attack? <laughs> in MS, we know that one to two years before the first classical MS attack or MS relapse, people experience fatigue, experience depression, experience like something like a low energy or low activity levels before, and they, they consult uh, caregivers um, before then the first classical MS relapse happens, like optic neuritis, something like that. Yeah, nice studies on that. In NMOST, I'm not aware of such a, uh, such a um, trial, but I would not be surprised if also any kind of unspecific, unspecific in terms of that you know, we can't, we can't claim that everyone with fatigue or everyone with depression, of course, uh, will end up result in NMOSC. This is the case. But I'm not aware, but I would not be surprised if a similar pattern would be the case. Perhaps my colleagues know uh, such a study. Simon, Michael, Sylvia. Simon, do you want to add anything to that? Well, only to say that um, just idiopathic hypersomnia is, is very common. Um, and we don't understand, you know, the cause of that at the moment, whether that's another autoimmune phenomenon, whether it's a genetic phenomenon, we just don't know, and whether, it, obviously, it can be a feature of other autoimmune conditions, um, including NMO. Um, and knowing what the relationship is, whether it's a, an association because they're autoimmune diseases or whether it's a genetic thing at the moment we just don't know. 
So I don't know of any predictive marker that's going to tell you that hypersomnia or any other sort of symptom is going to turn into a specific autoimmune disease at the moment. One thing that is coming uh, is that it's not enough to know the DNA sequence anymore. There's something called epigenetics, which is how the DNA in your body changes over time as you go through experience. That can be affected by infection or aging or other aspects, pregnancy. Um, so it's not enough to know just your DNA sequence. We need to know the modifications to it, which are called epigenetics, and we'll talk more about that. There's a question over here, please. Good morning. I was diagnosed 13 years ago. Um, when I first took sick, I, I did infusion, but I relapsed like three, four times back. But I was put on azathioprine, which is emerin. So now, the past two months, I, he tested me for the aquaporin full, and it came back positive finally. So we did it again to make sure. So then he was giving me an ultimatum, getting a new therapy, but I was like, wait, I always was told don't fix something that's not broken, and I've been stable since being on the eyes of thyroid. So my question was like, okay, when I get to end my patient, then I ask, what's their advice? Is it best to get the new therapist that's out or stay with on what's keeping me stable since taking it? That's a great question, and it's a big question. You know, when to consider changing therapy? And we're going to ask Michael to take the first shot at that one. Thank you. Okay, so my thinking is like this. With azathioprine, I know that there are risks involved long-term in using it, and I don't like those risks, like lymphomas and other cancers. So it's not very hard for me to recommend to patients to switch off of azathioprine. Um, we have three new FDA-approved treatments that have science and really good evidence to support them. And so whatever your experiences with the current drug are, it's hard to put that against really, really good science. Now, I have a lot of patients who are on rituximab, and in my, I've been using rituximab for 15 years in aquaporin 4 NMO, and it's, it's hard to let go of that really, really good experience and say, well, now the science supports these other three drugs. But that, that is where the science is, and for a lot of my patients who've been in remission for a long time, they're not letting go of their drug, whatever it is, but usually rituximab. And in my experience with rituximab, because it's so safe long-term, I, I don't push on that. Azathioprine is the one drug where I'll be like, come on, there are much better therapies, there are much safer ones long-term, and so if your doctor's pushing on, on you to switch, that's probably the one time where I would kind of support that. Um, that push, yeah. Michael, thank you. Um, others want to add to that on the panel? Any other comments about decision making to change therapy? Uh, it, is, it is always a difficult one that, um, you know, the, the notion of don't fix it if it ain't broke is a, is a very good adage in medicine in general. Um, but this is, I agree entirely with Michael, that this is one situation where over a long period of time the risks of azathioprine begin to mount um, and therefore there's actually a very good reason for considering a switch to other things that I think we would regard as probably being safer long term uh, with as equally good if not probably better and well proven efficacy. I would just add again as I mentioned earlier the studies of the approved therapies are continuing, and they're called post-marketing or phase four studies, where patients on the approved therapies are being carefully monitored for safety, and you're gonna start seeing some of those papers being published. For example, we think about the drugs that are approved having been approved you know, two or three years ago, but the fact is patients have been on those drugs for now seven or eight years, and so we're getting more experience, and the safety is really beginning to emerge as very positive. We have another question here. We'll have just one more question before we break and, and move to our next session. Um, Lisa? Okay, we're gonna, 
uh, have one other question. Um, here, please. Thank you. What I, what I would like to know is, um, is there something we could take into the emergency room? Because I won't go into an emergency room unless I'm kicking and screaming or half dead. Because nobody has ever known when I've gone in what is wrong, and then I, I could really use something that I could take with me that would give them an idea, not that I just have it, but what they can do, and then maybe who they could contact. Um, it's caused a lot of problems for me. That's a great question. And, you know, there are materials that the foundation has prepared for patients to keep with them, et cetera. But, um, Sylvia, let's start with, with kids in, in first presentation. How do we help ER emergency room doctors and other, you know, family practice doctors know about NMO and MOGAD and be, be able to detect it early? It's, it's essential. First, in order to give the acute therapy on time, I need the adequate doses. Um, but it's a, a hard work of teaching, because um, I, usually I give talks to um, internists in the intensive units who have patients under respirators, not knowing which is the diagnosis, because they have something on the brainstem they cannot understand. So they never start plasma exchange, for example, in order to take the kids out from the respirator. Just an example, not knowing the disorder. Not in our hospital, because it's a very big hospital, but there are a lot of hospitals in my country, and in many countries in Latin America, that not really understand what is neuromyelitis optica or what are the autoimmune disorders that may affect the central nervous system in children. So there, are not, um, there is not accreditation for neuroimmunologists, like somebody asked in Argentina, there is no that. You just take an accreditation as a pediatric neurologist and that's all. So this is a personal interest to become an expert or more interest in autoimmune disorders or neuroinflammatory disorders. It's just that. And I have to thank the Gatti Jackson Foundation because for the last 14 years, have, I have been learning from all of the colleagues, seeing adult patients. I have learned a lot of, from them. And I try to give my experience with children. And I'm trying to do the same in Argentina with pediatricians, with pediatric neurologists, with therapists. This is the, a hard work, but it's the only thing that we can do. Sylvia, thank you. To close this session, I might ask Simon and Orhan and Michael, if you had one thing that you would recommend be done to help professionals recognize NMO and MOGAD better, what would that be? I know it's putting you on the spot a little bit. Simon, can you just give us the thing that would most help your colleagues recognize NMO and MOGAD? Um, very difficult question. Thank you, Michael. Um, it is, look, it's very difficult. We, I think, you know, through our various forums of uh, neurology conferences, this is a topic that gets discussed a lot. Um, so I think the efforts are out there to try and educate our neurology colleagues um, about NMO and MOGAD. Um, the issue of wider dissemination to non-neurologists, so uh, doctors who work in the ER department, um, is, is much more difficult because they, and, and general practitioners as well, who have to deal with everything that walks in through the door, it is very difficult for them to keep abreast of all of these rare conditions uh, that are now being recognized in every area of medicine. Um, so it is very difficult to keep everyone um, kind of up to speed on everything. Um, and I think in an answer to the, to the last question, actually, I guess uh, the, the one thing to do is if you present to an ER department is just to very politely suggest that, you know, they contact your neurologist as soon as they can, or at least the neurology team. 
um, to get their input into your care as soon as possible. Uh, and you always have to be polite and sensitive about how you suggest that. Um, uh, but that's all I can suggest, really. Simon, thank you. Orhan? I'm dreaming of a bedside test. The emergency room, like the COVID tests, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> so that we can just put a drop, blood drop there in, and we know it's a copper four zero positive or mox zero positive, something like that. <laughs> 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 uh, because you know, <laughs> usually it's uh, it's it's like that. That in emergency room we are taking care of seizures, stroke, brain bleeding, and so on. But to to understand that an attack, an NMOST and MOGAT attack, is something that we have to take care of immediately and not wait another two or three days. This is, this is an issue. Orhan, thank you very much. Michael, we're going we're gonna to end with you. What would be the thing you would do overall? Uh, I, I would say that you know when I worked in the emergency room, you don't have the luxury of time to sit down for 20 minutes and read all about NMO and these rare diseases. So you have to think about it from the ER doctor's point of view. They just want to you treat you right and make all the right decisions without having to take the time to think through and read about these rare diseases. They just don't have the time. There's chaos going on in every emergency room that I've ever been in. So to make it easy on them, maybe a, a phone call to your doctor to basically say, here's my doctor, ask him what NMO is and what you should do, or, or just make it maybe the cards as a starting point, maybe even a hotline. Can the Guthy Jackson support maybe a hotline to route phones, uh, phone calls to an, an NMO expert who's available to just make it easy for the ER to hear about what NMO is in 20 seconds and what to do with the other 40 seconds of their time. That's what I would suggest. Michael, thank you. And we know, we know education begins, you know, even before medical school. So we've got to start well upstream. We've got to teach the next generation of doctors but as Victoria said, it really comes down to all of us spreading the word. And so, you know, believing is, is, is passive. We need to be active. We have to get the word out. And that takes all of us together. So with that, let's stop the, uh, the first session. We'll thank the experts here. Thank you so much.